Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. This is Greg LeBlanc. I'm here today with Catherine Wilson, who is an emerita professor at the University of York in philosophy, also the author of a recent book called How to Be an Epicurean, the Ancient Art of Living Well. Also written a bunch of other books, a couple I have with me, I have uh, Moral Animals and Epicureanism at the Origins of Modernity. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Greg. Now, I think somewhere in one of your books, you said, I guess you were channeling Richard Nixon, and you said that we are all Epicureans now, right? <laughs> and I think, you know, it. it's hard to make sense of that statement unless you are aware of what you are contrasting it with, right? And particularly when you go back to the 17th century, you know, and you see how Epicureanism kind of informed almost all of the things that we now think of as the the founding philosophies of, of modernity. And I was actually very surprised to see how both Rousseau and Hobbes were kind of building on Epicurean uh, models. But, um, but you also say that in, in general, you know, um, ancient moral philosophy is, is relevant for us as moderns. And you offer up a modern interpretation of Epicureanism, perhaps shorn of some of the somewhat bizarre scientific theories. Um, but, you know, you comment on all sorts of public affairs, <laughs> public events, using an Epicurean, or should we say a, a Lucretian perspective? Because I think that's really the way in which we know Epicurean philosophy best is through the work of, of Lucretius. And so why should we as moderns pay any attention whatsoever to ancient moral philosophy? I mean, you know, if you're in physics, you, you don't waste your time reading ancient physics. And if you are a biologist, you don't waste your time reading ancient biology. Look, I know that pretty much everyone I've interviewed on this podcast has figured out some way to smuggle in Aristotle, <laughs> you know, as a, as, as a, um, a source of some insight, but it's, it's usually not Aristotle's ethics and morals as much as it is his view of how to understand the world. So why should we care? Why should we all be thinking about getting up to speed or at least exposing ourselves to ancient moral philosophy? Well, I think um, the Epicureanism has been underappreciated relative to the other ancient philosophies. Uh, as we all know, Stoicism has become incredibly popular. Epicureanism is in many ways the foil to Stoicism. And frankly, I wouldn't go to Aristotle or Plato particularly for moral advice. Um, some good good parts of it, but I think Epicureanism really needed a fresh look. And so what I tried to do in the, in the book was to draw out, in some ways possibly more fetched than, <laughs> uh, than they needed to be, um, uh, some lessons or some, some implications that we could use now, taken directly from Epicurus and Lucretius. So that was the idea, yep. and uh, I think Epicureanism is really, uh, as I said, a, a breath of fresh air in many ways. Well, before we dig into the ethics and, and the morality of Epicureanism, I mean, you start the book with um, by recounting their theory of the natural world. Um, and, you know, it seems like for the ancients, it was, it was impossible to view what we might think of as, as science and, and what we think of as ethics and morals independently, right? They were intricately tied together. You know, why is that? I mean, certainly in the modern times, we, we tend to think of the, the positive and the normative as completely separate domains, but the ancients did not. Why, why is that? And do you think that we need to think about somehow bringing them back together in the modern world, the way we think about morals, we need to root it in some way in our understanding of the physical world? Yeah, absolutely. That was, um, that was an effect of positivism that uh, drew this sharp line between the, the factual and the normative and said you, these are completely different spheres, one has nothing to do with the other. And that's true in a way. Um, there's nothing that logically follows from the way the world is about what we should do. 
But the more you know about the way the world is, the more capable you are of responding to age-old human problems and political problems in a sensible way. Um, another, another field I've worked in is evolution and ethics, and that comes out quite a bit in the book because I talk about Darwin and uh, uh, evolutionary models of, maybe I didn't talk there, about evolutionary models of justice, but that's, of course, an important topic these days, game theory and uh, um, the evolution of cooperation, the evolution of competition. Um, so this is, I think that the, the connection is much closer in Epicureanism than it is in Stoicism, for example. Stoics tell us that uh, the world is a deterministic system, that fate determines what's going to happen, and that's about all you get by way of connection between their natural philosophy and their moral philosophy. Adjust to fate because you can't change anything. Whatever's going to happen, happens. And the Epicurean idea, I started this book with a lot of, as you say, natural philosophy, because I didn't want to start out with pleasure is the first and only good. That's what everybody knows about Epicureanism. And if you don't put it in context, it sounds very trivial or wrong. But if you start, I thought, with the atoms as the basic elements of the universe, and you start with their combination and disillusion, you already get a perspective about how things in the world come together and how they only stay together for a certain length of time before disintegrating. You're already in the realm of evolution, change, novelty, construction and destruction, and that leads you into all the problems of life and all the problems of politics. So uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing to me when I read these, when I read these old philosophers. I mean, I remember reading the Pre-Socratics and thinking, man, it must have been so exciting, right, to be the people who are thinking about this stuff really for the for the first time. And um, and I was really struck by how it seems like the Epicurean view is kind of like a, a proto-Darwinian view of, of the world. I mean, there are these huge echoes, but Darwin never gave any credit, right, to Lucretius or to the Epicureans, right? I mean, he was clearly he must have been aware of them, but he, he never seemed to give any credit to them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, he didn't want to because his wife was a Christian, but Everybody who read Darwin, who was educated, knew, and I think I, I quote in the book someone who says, this is just uh, warmed over Lucretius, or this is Lucretius, but really put on a firm footing now. Um, his, his own grandfather was well-versed in Lucretius and had written uh, his own didactic poem about evolution. Yeah, but so so Epicureanism is kind of like a, a bogeyman during the Christian era, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems like, it, you know, Christianity seems to have, I mean, we all know about the scholasticism and the Aristotelian roots of Christian theology, but there's also like a heavy strain of Stoicism in in, in Christianity. And, uh, and so the Epicureans represented something that was very materialistic and... Um, and threatening to the Christian order. Um, you know, why was that? I mean, is that, is that because they had an accurate understanding of Epicureanism or is it because they distorted it into this kind of exaggerated hedonistic view of the world? Well, I think it was, it was both. Um, they knew that the Epicureans denied the divine, divine creation of the world supervision of the world by God or gods, any kind of planning or providence. They knew that Epicureans thought the soul was mortal. When you die, you just uh, turn into dust. And uh, Christianity validated suffering, the whole idea of suffering on the cross and sacrifice. And, of course, as a political instrument, um, Christians were told for centuries, uh, your suffering doesn't matter. Just consider how much worse it was for the one on the cross. 
your problems are trivial, your economic and political problems are trivial compared to that. So Epicurean idea that pleasure is the first and only real good was completely antithetical to what they wanted to say. So Epicureans seem to have a view of pleasure and pain as something primary, right? Something that is is very very direct. But but you also point out that they they had this understanding that things like color and and taste, I mean, they were really uh, a function of the perspective or the subjective experience. And 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 so, I mean, isn't the pleasure and pain that one experiences also in part uh, a function of sort of how you decide that you're going to, you know, interpret your experience? Yeah. <laughs> Right. What gives some people pleasure leaves other people completely indifferent or they don't like it. Taste, travel, certain kinds of music. So it is an, an individual thing. But they still thought in their... And they pointed in a way that offended Stoics and Christians as well. They said, um, just look at the animals. They're trying to pursue pleasure and escape pain. And all the opponents said, you are reducing humans to the level of animals. And, of course, once you get into the real details of Epicureanism, they were doing no such thing. Um, but it was a, a cheap yet effective shot that their opponents mm -hmm. could produce. So I think a lot of people are surprised when they find out that Epicurus had a relatively simple life, right? <laughs> you know, he's eating what, like, you know, bread and, and and a little bit of cheese and stuff. I mean, I think most people would suspect that he'd be at the banquets, right? you know, he'd be hanging out at the, uh, you know, French laundry and, and uh, you know, lounging on couches and living some kind of uh, debauched uh, life. I mean, is, is that the way, I mean, if you were to survey the average person who had heard of Epicureanism, I'm sure that that's what they would think, right? That maximizing pleasure means debauchery. It means, you know, carpe diem, right? <clears throat> yeah, quite right. I'm not sure that uh, Epicurus really subsisted on cheese, bread, and water, but that's what he says is all you need. Probably the diet was a little more uh, Mediterranean and varied than, than comes across. But it's an interesting question, and I don't, exactly know the answer to this question, how did the image of the Epicurean become, shift from something like pigs in the trough or drunken people you know, staggering around into something like a refined Epicurean, dilettantish, um, what, uh, aficionado of wines and 175 varieties of cheese because this transformation did happen and I think it began in the 18th century. Um, it probably has to do with the luxury trade and wealth and secularization uh, but I've never read anything that explained exactly the formation of this new image. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it's well, in, in well, I mean, in, you say, I mean, in your advice, I mean, this book is in partially, it's it's a bit of a book of advice. I mean, you're kind of offering people some self-help to some degree <laughs> about how to live as as an Epicurean. And, and you say that, you know, well, yeah, by all means, um, enjoy your 500 uh, types of cheese. Just don't get too obsessed with it. But, you know, Lucretius, I mean, the guy killed himself over some kind of, what romantic uh, mishap? I mean, how do you? I mean, that that seems that doesn't seem uh, consistent with with the story that you tell. I mean, who goes around killing themselves over heartbreak um, if they're a philosopher? That doesn't seem very philosophical. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's right. Um, but the Epicureans, unlike the Stoics did not think we are in complete control of our emotional reactions. And when he talks about romantic disappointment, Lucretius says, by the time you're into it, it's too late. If you want to save yourself some anguish, stop the thing in its tracks before it gets to that stage. 
So apparently he didn't stop it in its tracks. And <clears throat> I don't know the details, you know, whether it really was a romantic suicide or what, but that was what was, what was reported. So do as I say, not as I do, that, that kind of thing? Well, yeah. I mean, he certainly doesn't recommend a suicide for romantic disappointment. But he doesn't underestimate you know, the, the force of uh, romantic attachments or what they can drive people to. He says uh, jealousy is one of the most horrible emotions that anyone can experience. That's certainly true leads people to mm -hmm. murder and suicide. Yeah. Right. So maybe a well, touch I mean, of stoicism would be, would be useful. So I, I remember reading um, folks like, you know, John Locke, who they were inspired by Lucretius, right? About this whole idea of pleasure and, and, and pain. But I think their view was that this was consistent with their view of Christianity and that, you know, the signals of pleasure and pain, these were kind of divinely ordained. They were, they were like, this is God's instruction. This is how you know what's good for you. <laughs> if, it, if it's pleasurable, then it must be good for you. And if it's, it's painful, it, it must be, uh, be bad for you, right? Um, I mean, th that, that seemed to be a domestication of or a Christianization of Epicureanism. Yeah. And did that come from, I think you, you, you cited... Uh, Pierre Gassendi, I mean, was he the one that first tried to stitch these things together? Well, the, there is a, a movement called uh, Christian Epicureanism um, that's uh, associated with the Renaissance, but I think it's really Descartes who starts this, and Locke gets it from Descartes, because uh, Descartes has this idea of the body as a machine, and the body is responding to stimuli from the external world that are showing it what to pursue and what to avoid in order to maintain its short life. And then, of course, this has to be, has to be given a theological frame because that's what Descartes does in his famous meditations. So you can say uh, God has constructed the human body and the human reactions um, with this in mind, that will be driven by these forces, and um, that's how God wants it to be. And uh, Locke takes this even further, as you said, he actually has a hedonistic ethics. That's, this has been realized for, for some time. Then, of course, there's the, uh, the part where you say it and the part where you take it all back, as Austin said. Then he, he has to point out that you can always say stop, you can always resist, uh, even the, if the drunkard really prefers losing his eyesight to giving up his soak in the tavern, as Locke puts it. You know, he, he could say stop, but maybe he doesn't mm -hmm. because he doesn't take well, the Well, I mean, view. you... <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's where, I guess, prudence comes in. I think um, you say that Lucretius really prioritizes uh, prudence. Um, but, I mean... We normally think of prudence as a, as a virtue, right? There's like an Aristotelian uh, virtue. Um, but the, the word virtue never seems to pop up in your account of the Epicureans. And so, you know, how is prudence, I, I think you said that prudence is, is derived from, from nature in some way. It's so a, it's how, how, so should, how should we be thinking, how should we be thinking of prudence as a, as a, as a governing principle? Yeah. Um, for, for Epicurus, it's pure self-interest. If you take the long view, if you know how the world works and what's likely to happen, then accepting some present pains in order to make your life less painful or more pleasant later is rational. And so you do it. And conversely, mm -hmm. accepting some pain now now for future pleasure and avoiding some pleasure now in order to prevent future pains is also self-protective. So it all comes down to self-interest. Yeah, I mean, this, this, start, this part seemed very consistent with a lot of the, what we might think of as um, psychology-rooted self-help, right, that people get exposed to. Um, I was just um, doing an interview recently on 
hedonic adaptation. And, you know, the idea that we oftentimes, um, we don't think through how things are going to affect us right in, in the future. Maybe our discount rates are a little bit too high. You know, we're, we're not thinking of these uh, spillover effects and so forth. Um, and so in, in some sense, you, you know, the, Lucretius is a psychological realist. He, he's, he's deeply interested in, in how our subjective impressions of what gives us pleasure might differ from what actually gives us pleasure. So in that sense, he's a psychologist, right? Um, yeah, I don't think he's skeptical about what gives me pleasure right now. I know whether I'm having a good time or a bad time, pretty much. Um, but what I have to be more thoughtful about is where is this leading? What's going to happen if I persist in this pursuit or this behavior? Um, what happens if I don't take certain precautions? And this uh, um, hedonic um, watch acceptability point, one can set it too low or too high. Um, you can be overly prudent. You can take out unnecessary insurance against things that are never going to happen. You can deny yourself nice experiences because you think you have to save $5 million by the time you're 65, even though you don't. So, well, the usual example is of people being imprudent and too careless about the future, including in Locke, um, you have to find the balance. Mm -hmm. So when he's critiquing the, the people in his, his society for uh, failing to kind of get it right, what's his, big, what's his main critique? Is it that there are people who are unnecessarily depriving others or themselves of, of pleasure for illusory um, goals and purposes? Or is it that yeah. he thinks people fail to understand, you know, what their, you know, how to manage their pleasure and how to, how to be prudent with respect to their pleasure? Yeah, there's certainly um, uh, a lot to say about individual, individual behavior, individual behavior that's um, purely structured on self-interest, and about ethical relations with others. Um, where self-interest comes into it, but in a sort of different way. So he, Epicurus did think, and Lucretius as well, most people are pursuing something that will not make them happy and that will just create a lot of trouble and aggravation. Political ambition, um, wealth, um, dominance in, in a field, all of these things end up uh, usually involving people in very painful experiences. People who just have to be the best at everything. You know, we know about all these actors and actresses who come to unfortunate ends because, or addictions, alcoholism, uh, because the costs of this sort of struggle are, are pretty overwhelming. So the Epicurean wants to focus on your intrinsic motivations for doing things. Um, if you want to be a, if you want to study logic, do it because you find logic absolutely fascinating. If you want to be a pianist, do it because you love playing the piano. But if your if your goal is being the best or the highest paid or the most important you're probably letting yourself in for you know, disappointment and pain. So lowering so aspirations, doing things for intrinsic reasons is an important part of it. So this is kind of the basis for a therapeutic uh, protocol. I mean, why haven't we seen, I mean, we see a lot of Freudian uh, psychotherapists. Where are our Epicurean therapists? Could this be a new, uh, a, a new, uh, new discipline? Yeah, this could, this could be a thing. Yeah. So we could, uh, we, well, the other, it's slogan could be the opposite of be best. Isn't that the Melania mm -hmm. Trump slogan? You don't have to be the best. Well, but I... But I think a lot of people would also say, and I think you allude to this in the book, that um, 
one maybe misinterpretation of that form of therapy is that you should kind of, I don't know, tune out, right? Just check out. I mean, isn't Candide cultivating his garden kind of an Epicurean? Because he sort of yeah. removed himself from the the political realm, from the social realm. You know, he's, he's not trying to make the world a better place. He's not trying to do anything other than just look around and see how beautiful nature is and, you know, have a nice day. I mean, isn't that a critique that, you know, this is a way of abdicating one's responsibility to the world? Yeah, well, this is, this is the weak point of Epicureanism, in my view. Um, it is a kind of checking out. Um, Epicureans moved outside the city. They didn't want to have anything to do with politics or um, you know, legal struggles or anything like that. They just wanted to read, study, learn, talk to each other, have conversations and communal meals, and that was enough. So yes, you can say this is um, this is irresponsible. We should take political stands. We should be active in making the world a better place. And I think that's that's quite right. That's that's good criticism. Um, but where I think the the position makes makes sense is in questioning many of the ideals that we give to young people. We we teach them to pursue external validation rather than finding things that are gratifying and interesting to them as human beings. As human beings, people like to learn and understand and enjoy nature, and those things should be cultivated. So. And so I guess you're saying that it's if we had to choose between people cultivating themselves and engaging in you know, warfare and conquest and domination, if that's what it means to be concerned with the external world, then n no thank you, right? So perhaps more harm comes out of this desire to engage the world than, than benefit? Absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, the Epicureans take a very critical perspective on warfare and kingship and political domination and what leads to it. They think the world would be a better place if people uh, weren't struggling to dominate and control others and seize their resources, which they do not need. So the pursuit of wealth and the pursuit of power are the root of all evil in their view. And so that seems to be part of the critique of the Stoics, right? So I think... You, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of hard to disagree with the notion that you know courage and and bravery and fortitude is is a virtue, but I, I think the the critique would be that if if those things are in the service of of conquest or or war or domination, then you know they're they're less desirable. I mean, is, is it necessarily the case that something like stoicism is ultimately going to be in league with, with those, those negative goals, negative ends? I'm afraid so. I think this is, uh, this is the philosophy that is taught in military academies, uh, which are sympathetic to stoicism. Of course, there is, I think, a current of enlightenment in some military academies and some rethinking of how to think about war and peace and uh, I mean look would you would you want your soldiers to be focused on you know pleasure <laughs> I mean you know you're going to fight the enemy and then you know you have I mean that was the the joke about the French soldiers that they would spend all their time drinking wine and and eating pate instead of fighting the Germans right yeah well I don't want them uh, <clears throat> fighting in the first place um, if they're going to fight, if it's necessary to police the world, to prevent wrongdoing, yes, it's better that uh, they, should be, they should be courageous. But the Epicurean perspective is that because we have a whole culture, or did have a whole culture, now it's being questioned, that really valorized aggression and power and domination 
the way we're taught history is about the great conquerors and uh, what they, how they extended their territories and all of that. Um, that's the background to our culture. And the Epicurean says, wait a minute, doesn't have to be that way. Um, you look back at that history, as even Bale said in the 17th century, it's just a record of crimes and misfortunes. Why aren't we doing something different? Why don't we have... Why don't we try much harder to arrange our political system so that uh, we don't have to confront the other great powers of the world with our own great power? And I think there's also a very different view of uh, the genders and a different view of, of slavery. And, and this, this comes from emphasizing the distinction between nature and, and convention. Uh, and that's, you know, the classic dichotomy that you see throughout Greek philosophy, but it has, has really profound consequences. And it also makes it very different from, I guess we might think of as neo-Darwinism, right? Because neo-Darwinism tries to condense everything to nature, right? And, and is, is not as, um, it makes, makes less effort to, right? Uh, emphasize this distinction between what is what is man-made and and what is not um and so you know why is it so important to maintain that theoretical or conceptual distinction between nature and culture or you know nomos and and, and physis well it used to be that nature was what you couldn't change and culture was what you could change the boundary is not that sharp between nature and culture um, for one thing, humans aren't like the other animals, as the Epicureans stress, uh, because our cognitive capacities are so complicated, so powerful. Um, the range of imagination and understanding and what we can do with our hands and what we can do with our bodies is far beyond what any other animal can do. And this, of course means that um, the sort of simplistic versions of evolutionary psychology uh, are, uh, don't really capture much of human experience or don't provide much of a guideline about how we should organize a society. But it's still useful to think in terms of what is just a cultural invention that doesn't have to be this way, that just came along for historical reasons and that we could rethink Whereas now a lot of people are wanting to rethink deep into nature, uh, like genetic engineering, uh, neurological re-engineering. Mm -hmm. um, these would be very, so. I mean, very when, when Arist I mean, Arist so when Aristotle saw, for instance, you know, differential gender roles or the kind of universal existence of of slavery in every society. That just seemed like a um, natural phenomenon, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He looked around and said, oh, I see we have these slaves and we have these masters, and now I'm going to theorize for you uh, why it is that way. And he ends up saying, well, it's built into the cosmos. There are higher beings and lower beings, and besides, the, the grain doesn't thresh itself. Someone has to do it. So it all seemed logical. People looked at uh, what women were doing, what men were doing, and said, now I'll theorize that for you. Now, here's why it is the way it is. Uh, the women aren't very bright, but they're very well adapted to uh, bearing children and taking care of them. And of course, now we know that wasn't the whole story. And... There's a lot more to the question, why do we see what we see when we look at the social Yeah, I mean, he, he, you know, you had this wonderful section on how Epicureanism is consistent with sort of a, a scientific view of provisional beliefs, right? And how it advocates a kind of comfort with uncertainty and this bit about um, what unthings, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you discover that something is is no longer true, 
um, you're like, okay, well, let's just, you know, flush that and, and, and move on. Um, I mean, that, that seems th- this comfort with provisional beliefs. I mean, th- this, this does make it different from lots of other schools of philosophy, right? Uh, because your beliefs are uh, always open to revision based on further experience. Yeah, I think this is not this is not stressed in Aristotle or Plato or Stoicism, which uh, try to tell you here's how the world works. I figured it out. Here you go. And this is, uh, I think, one of the most appealing features of Epicureanism that because nature is always making new combinations and presenting you with new experiences, uh, you're constantly having to update your beliefs, rethink your assumptions. Well, I I think that one of the biggest critiques of Epicureanism has to do with its view of of morals, right? Um, And and so, you know, you you define morals in in one of your books as, um, what was it, like, Disad, disadvent, dis, disadvantaging yourself or, or something, you know, uh, hampering your, your self-interest in some way. And it seemed kind of hard to reconcile that with a view of, you know, self-interest. And so, you know, one way is to say, oh, well, it's enlightened self-interest. Or, and there's this idea that, well, if you do something that harms others, sooner or later it's going to catch up to you. And in and, a and way, this doesn't seem that different from the pulling a rabbit out of a hat in the same way that, that people who believe in the afterlife would say, well, mm-hmm. if you behave poorly in this world, you know, ultimately you'll, you'll pay the price uh, later. I mean, is that's certainly not the only reason why one ought to try to be moral for fear of, of punishment, but it seems to play a big role. And, and it does do they kind of try a little bit too hard to reconcile prudence and, and morality. Um, that seems to be a big critique. Yeah, yeah. And um, that is another weak point. Um, I think there, there are two aspects here. What's the content of morality? What's morality really about? And two, what's the motivation to be moral? I think Kant was very clear that these are two separate questions and... He thought the Stoics were very good on the content, but gave you no motive. And the Epicureans were terrible on the content, but at least they gave you a motive, pleasure and pain. Um, so, you know, you mentioned the, the thesis in Moral Animals, that uh, morality is what I called an advantage-reducing imperative. Um, to be moral is to not do something you could do that will make your position better, or not worse, Uh, but that extracts a cost from someone else. And that's very much the content of Epicurean morality. Epicurus says morality is a convention whereby one person does not harm another, avoids harming another. It's about minimizing harm to others. There's the content. That's all it is. We don't even have to talk about courage and wisdom and temperance and all of that. Just don't harm but now they have a problem. How do you motivate that? Because it's in your advantage to harm somebody else by withholding the truth or exploiting them or keeping them in ignorance or doing something else. And as you say, the, uh, the Epicureans said, uh, well, th- we have a system of social punishment. You always get found out and you get a bad reputation and people don't cooperate with you. This was already what Adam Smith and uh, David Hume were kind of saying in their 18th century textbooks. And it's what contemporary game theorists tell us as well. You don't want to be get a reputation as a non-cooperator and someone who exploits uh, because people won't, uh, won't treat you very well. The problem is the system is imperfect. Uh, social punishment doesn't always work just as legal punishment doesn't always work. So there are always going to be people who get away with things on the uh, exalted political level as well as on the personal level. You can't do much about those people. Uh, You can pursue them with the instruments of justice, which try to prevent harm. You can pursue them with social punishment. 
um, or you can avoid them if you can. Um, but that's why uh, many religions insisted that there must be some retribution and some reward after death because uh, everyone can see it doesn't always happen in this world. Yeah, but that, that, that doesn't sound like morality. That sounds like, you know, self-interest. That sounds like convention. I mean, normally we think of morality as, as something where even in the absence of any kind of punishment, even in the absence of any loss of reputation, you know, you do it. You do it when no one's looking, right? You know, you, 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 you don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing, right? I mean, that, that's sort of the whole, when we think of morality as a separate category, separate from prudence. Right, and th this is what uh, Adam Smith tried to do, um, to say, well, you internalize the judgment of society, you know, the, the impartial observer. You're able to um, treat yourself as, as the impartial observer would in assessing your situation and, and what you're doing. Um, so you're right that it's hard to hook up the content of morality, don't harm other people for your advantage, with this advantage-based theory of motivation. And they don't do it, but um, I don't think any other moral theory does it either. Do you think it's hard to live an Epicurean life? I mean, it, it sounds like a lot of fun. I mean, it sounds pretty attractive. But, but I think you, you, you highlight how there are always pressures to, to deviate from it, so, some of which come from, say, you know, a stoic view. But, but m probably more common would be you talk about, like, the, the merchants of pleasure. Right? And, and the, there are all these sort of uh, temptations and, and pressures um, that kind of will get you off this, this course. And, and alter, I mean, which is, which is the, the biggest threat, you think, for someone who is, is trying to follow this course? Yeah. Um, well, in, in the book, I spend a lot of time ridiculing consumerism and mm -hmm. <clears throat> trying to show that a lot of uh, purchases that we make don't actually satisfy us or make us any happier than we were. But I think so, so the people we call hedonists are, aren't really hedonists in the Epicurean sense. Uh, the people we call hedonists. Um, you know, who are the people, these people who are gorging themselves on brownies uh, or no. whatever. <laughs> no, no, no. But the way we're wired, we, we respond to novelty. Um, we like glittery, fast, complicated things. Um, we love sweets. We like alcohol. Some of us like drugs. You talked about like glitter socks. What the heck yeah, are glitter, glitter socks? socks. I, 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 this is something I read about. I used that example. I was like, what the heck are these? I've never seen these things. What are glitter socks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you haven't spent much time in your local Woolworths. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> right. or, or Walmart. Um, so our, our nervous systems are kind of keyed up to enjoy these things and to want to possess them and, and have them. And even though we know on some level that they won't make us happy the next day, uh, we pursue them. So just getting, getting an awareness of this is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, asking oneself, uh, do I really expect to get much long-term pleasure out of this for what it's going to cost me is important. And, and do you think that is what accounts for the renewed success of stoicism in popular culture now? Is it because, is this sort of a, I don't know, a reaction to the hollowness of um, consumerism? Well, I would, I would have thought that the popularity of stoicism comes from human suffering that people are, are unhappy in relationships, they're unhappy in their family life, they're unhappy in their work life. And Stoicism kind of says, well, you are you and you are a fortress in yourself and you have to not be so worried about what other people are doing that is making you miserable and, and believe that it's under your control whether you're miserable or not. And this seems to me completely on the wrong track. 
when other people and other situations are making you miserable, you ought to try to change them. Speak up or get out of there. Um, don't suffer in silence was, I think, the, the title of one of the chapters. And I, I think I referred there to Hirschman. Uh, how do you respond to bad situations? Exit voice or loyalty? Yeah, I was glad you got an economist in there. <laughs> you know, we need to, you got to have at least one economist in there. But um, but I think one of the biggest critiques of both um, Epicureanism and Stoicism is that they they don't really address this idea of, of meaning adequately and, and purpose, right? And and I think this would be, um, you know, a, a critique that Christians would offer, but also uh, non-Christian folks. Um is that a, is that a problem uh, for some of these schools of ancient philosophy? Um, meaning, um, yeah, I've never exactly understood this problem. Although, though, I know I know it comes up. I know it comes up in the literature. I know it comes up. Uh, I had a family member who was very worried about the meaning of life and what's it all about. And I could never quite see it, um, because it seems to me that well, even if you're Napoleon or Alexander, or you get the Nobel Prize for physics, it's just not going to matter very much in 5,000 years. The, the Epicurean perspective is really cosmological. It says, you are here for a very short amount of time in the history of the universe, you came from dust, you're going to end up in dust. What you should do in that short time is have a nice life. Do the things you enjoy doing. And learning and teaching and figuring things out and taking part in family life, those are the things that usually give people the most satisfaction in life. As human beings, that's what we like to do. So. Well, you don't have to, right, go to excess. <laughs> and well, I mean, it seems like, um, I mean, Lucretius at least seems to be both an optimist and a pessimist at the same time. I mean, if you read, you know, uh, book one, you, you, you get you get one view of the world, which is enchanting and, mm -hmm. and charming and beautiful. And, you know, every day it, you're surrounded by um, wonder <laughs> and gratitude and, and amazement, and then you know you get to book six, and it's just a yeah. <laughs> veil of tears. I mean, yes. how can the both views coexist? I mean, are these two different people, <laughs> 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 two different worlds, or were they written at different points in time? You know, pre and post plague. I mean, what was going on here? It's all all part of life, um, as we know from the plague that we just experienced. That um, killed and crippled so many millions of people. Um, we are not powerful against nature as a whole. We can be temporarily powerful, but nature in the end is more powerful, as Spinoza, I think, said. Um, so you know, there is this need to carve out your sphere of happiness while you can, um, being aware that it could all come to an end any time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of the forces of nature. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I always wonder about the influence of different authors and different books. And it seems like Lucretius is probably the most influential author who, and least read author, right? If there was a ratio of influence to <laughs> actual direct exposure. I mean, he would probably have the, the biggest, biggest ratio. I mean, I, I took many philosophy classes and history classes and, and, you know, we, we were never assigned Lucretius. No. I, I had to go read it myself because I kept seeing all these, you know, references. And I said, well, I, I got to go check it out for my, myself. I mean, it's probably never assigned in, you know, most schools and, and most classes. And yet it, it, the influence is everywhere. Is do we need direct exposure? Should we, should we you know, rehabilitate uh, these these primary texts? Um, 
Can you think of another author who's had such a similar <laughs> ratio of influence to uh, exposure? No, I think that's, that's just right. When I had ancient philosophy, we had Aristotle, Plato, and Stoics. Maybe we had some cynics or somebody thrown in there, or we learned a little bit about Democritus. He said everything is Adam's. A few sayings of Epicurus, but no Lucretius. And, of course, Epicure, uh, Lucretius being a poet, this is sort of a barrier for many people. You might think, why mm -hmm. in an introductory philosophy course should I read some poetry? And you have to read quite a bit of the poetry to get to the ethical part or to try to extract that. So, um, yes, I think we need to revise our teaching methods and we need to... Um, keep trying to combat this image of the Epicureans as basically superficial, trivial people um, that cannot be taken seriously because they don't understand ethics, they don't understand politics, um, they, are, uh, they are reduce humans to the level of animals and all this other, all the other criticisms that we've uh, heard for millennia. Uh, we need to Take them in their own terms. Now, when you look around the world today at the contemporary landscape, where, where do you see echoes of, of Epicureanism? I mean, because you said we're all Epicureans now, but it, it seems to just exist as a, as a, as a sort of substrate. I mean, do, do we have philosophers in the world now? Do we have public figures in the world now who are espousing something that is recognizably Epicurean to your view? Well, not really, because um, everybody has to be nominally Christian in politics and uh, <clears throat> refer to God and pray for things and pray for people and all of that. That's completely non-Epicurean. Um, but, of course, all policies that have to do with, with the welfare of human beings that take their pains and pleasures, especially their pains, seriously. Because in a way, Epicureanism is more about preventing and avoiding pain than it is about pursuing pleasure. Um, you know, all programs that are designed to relieve suffering in politics, which all the parties first want to do, Democrats more visibly than Republicans. But, but he did also say that it would be prudential for you to wear on the outside the, the conventional beliefs of your society, right? You, you, you don't want to, especially in a society that is intolerant of your perspective, it, it, it makes sense to at least um, go through the motions of presenting yourself as pious or devout. Oh, well, Epicurus uh, thought he, he had to do that. Of course, um, everyone had the lesson of, of Plato in mind, who openly was accused of right, corrupting the Athenian youth. And, uh, Socrates. Uh, suffered, Socrates, yeah, Socrates. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Suffered for it. Had mm -hmm. to get himself out of the way to avoid a, a worse fate. Um, mm -hmm. But no, um, conforming to convention... Epicurus was uh, thought to be pious, but um, many people thought, yes, he was doing it for reasons of self-preservation. But I wouldn't put a lot, of, um, a lot of emphasis on conformity to mainstream social beliefs as part of Epicureanism. Well, Catherine, I, you know, if we had time, I would be asking you for restaurant recommendations. <laughs> I'd be asking you for uh, places where I ought to travel because I know that you probably uh, have some insight there. Um, certainly, based on the book, um, I think you, oh. you you figured out a way to uh, live a, a good life um, <laughs> of intellectual excitement and, and pleasure. So thanks so much for joining me. Uh, this book is called How to Be... An Epicurean, the ancient art and modern art of living well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Guy. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 